Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video we're taking a BIOS tour of the almost legendary B450M Pro 4 from ASRock. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video, we'll be taking a look at the BIOS on the ASRock B450M Pro 4, uh, very much a legendary board, and actually still supports up to some of the latest and greatest processors from AMD. There have been quite a few modifications to the BIOS as time has gone on, so I figured now would be a good time in 2022 to uh, have a quick look through, go through some of the features and the settings. Now, if there's anything in here which I uh, briefly skip over, but you want to know more information about, we do have a fantastic Discord chat server, which you're more than welcome to join. Links will be in the video description for that. Or alternatively, obviously, just let us know in the comments section below. But with that said, let's get on and take a look. So starting off, we have the UEFI BIOS. So this is the main page, as you can see. So it tells you the BIOS version. We're currently on version P5.30, which is the latest one as of today's recording date, which is Friday the 13th, 2022. Tells us our processor, currently on a Ryzen 5 3600 6 core processor, tells us the processor speed, the microcode update version, our total memory installed, and what channels are currently in use. As you can see, currently we do have our XMP profiles enabled for both of our sticks of DDR4 RAM. So that is the main page. Other things you can get to from here is obviously all the rest of the tabs along the top. We've also got a QR code so you can get more information there and also tells you your language, which you can change if you wish to from there. If you want to play a prank on someone, feel free to uh, change it to uh, yeah, one of the other languages available. And also you've got your time and date settings there, which you can manually change at the time and date should you need to. Although really that will probably pick up if you've got a LAN connection connected to your PC. So yeah, if you wanna make a change, change it and click apply, job done. So that is the main page. So next one is going to be our OC tweaker. So there's going to be a lot of stuff in here, which uh, some of it we're going to cover, some of it we won't, we'll skip over. Again, if you want to know more, let us know in the comments section. Really good actually on the ASRock BIOS currently. It does have a fantastic description section over on the right hand side. So if you're not entirely sure, then you can obviously read through that or you can scan the QR code with your mobile device, uh, Android or iOS, and it will take you into more information, which is excellent. So first of all, we've got our overclock mode, our bus speed. So currently set to auto options for that. You've got manual and then you can change your B clock or your base clock frequency. Generally, most AMD processors, I think pretty much all of them actually are somewhere around the sort of 99.5 to 100 megahertz. That is the kind of the usual, but you can, if you want to put a manual one in, so you can put in maybe 103 and then that will just up basically the PCI Express bus and also the B clock, which on some systems you may find that's a way of squeezing a little bit more performance. If you can adjust your multiplier, then you can certainly adjust your B clock a little bit just to grab a little bit more performance. If you're not sure what you're doing or you've put in the wrong figure, if you just put in zero, it'll just go back to auto. So you've got your Southbridge clock spread spectrum. Right, well, that's hard for me to say. Uh, sometimes if you're actually having issues with uh, EMI interference, you can enable the spectrum realistically of modern years, I don't think anyone actually really does it specifically, but you can obviously choose enable, disabled or auto. Auto, as with most things in this bar, so as we go through, auto is probably gonna be the best setting for pretty much, I would say 95% of users. Anyway, so moving on, so we've got the CPU frequency and uh, vid change or voltage change. So you've got auto and manual, so you can go in and change your frequency of the processor. If you've got an unlocked processor, you can also change your voltages and the SOC voltage. Again, you can change, just put it a, a manual one in there. So you've got between 0.9 and 1.55. If you want to change settings there, you can do. Personally, I would say the way the Ryzen works these days, you're probably best leaving that to auto and maybe doing most of this stuff actually in something like Ryzen Master. But again, you can make changes if you want to here. Uh, you've got your SOC Uncore OKC mode. So this is for part of AMD's overclocking. Uh, this basically forces the SOC to be at a specific speed or run against the kind of infinity fabric, as it says there on the side, I'm probably, that's probably gonna be a much better way of explaining it. Again, if you're not sure what you're doing, leave these as auto, but I just wanna show you really what features are available in the board. So next up, we've got the uh, VGDP voltage control. So that is basically for your DDR RAM and the way that all links together. Again, if you're not sure, leave it well alone. And you've got the same there for AMD's overclocking 
for the SOC and core voltages, etc., etc. So you can make all the changes you want to there. But your DRAM information tells you, if you click on it, tells you the specific sticks you've got. So we've got Corsair sticks, part numbers, module size, the DRAM manufacturer, etc., etc., serial numbers, all that kind of stuff. And if you go into the next one, load XMP settings. So you've got options for your XMP. So you've got auto, which will be basically the, the defaults of the DDR. So probably like DDR 2666 or 2400, 2133, all those kinds of stuff, depending on what it is. Or you can enable your XMP profiles. If you've got more than one profile, it will show up here and give you your timings there. So DDR4 3000, 16, 20, 20, 38 at 1.35 volts is what this set is rated for. So we'll leave it as that. If for some reason you're overclocking or you're using RAM on the B450 platform, which is kind of out of spec, so maybe you've got DDR4 3600, you can go into here and you can manually adjust your frequency. So if 3600 fails to boot for some reason, you could then drop it down to maybe 3466, uh, 3400, 3333. Again, conversely, you can overclock in that respect as well. So you can set your XMP setting. And if you want to, like this is DDR4 3000. I could try 3200, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll lock that in, see what happens. It may well work quite happily at that, and we may be able to push it even further, but anyway, that is uh, options you've got there. DRAM voltage, you can manually configure your DRAM voltage. Uh, XMP will normally default to 1.35 volts. If you're using it without XMP, it will default to 1.2 volts. If you want to overclock a little bit and squeeze a bit more, you can probably get a little bit more voltage in there. Depending on your RAM modules, you may be able to push that up actually quite high, but so again, if you're not too sure, I would leave well alone or adjust it in very small increments, maybe uh, 25 millivolts, that sort of thing, and just to gain some stability should you need to. Next one up is going to be the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers. So that's generally set to automatic. So normally you kind of want to run one to one. So if your processor has a Infinity Fabric of say 1800 and you're running DDR4 3600, that is a one to one effectively or two to one it basically balances out. So in here you can change it so you can actually choose the specific clock for your Infinity Fabric. So maybe your processor will run at a higher Infinity Fabric, maybe it runs at a lower fabric. Again, you can choose those settings. Personally, I would say you're probably best off leaving that to auto. Uh, next up you've got your DRAM timing configurations. So it tells you your CAS latencies. So this is if your uh, XMP profile is being incorrectly registered on the system. So say for instance, this is a CL16 kit. If it, for some reason, said 17 there, I could go in and manually change it. Or conversely, if it registers as a 16 and it's actually a 15, you could go ahead, type in 15, you get the general idea. So let's put that back to what it should be. Again, you can do that for all the different settings there. You've got your uh, fail counts. So if for some reason the system fails to boot for three cycles, it will then kind of uh, go back to the factory based defaults rather than XMPs, all that kind of stuff. And underneath that, you've got your cycle time, your RAS to RAS and all those kinds of things which you can change manually should you wish to. There's an absolute ton of settings you can access. Again, okay, most people probably will never do that. Uh, power down, so you've got your data bus configuration, cab bus configuration. This is all to do with your uh, memory again. If, unless you know what you're doing, which I honestly don't, I would leave these things well alone, but certainly it is available so you can change these settings should you wish to. There's a, a whole host of settings in here, which gets uh, rather complicated. Again, I would suggest maybe a specific memory video basically on that so you know or understand what is actually going on there. Uh, next one, you've got your external voltage settings and load line calibration settings. So you can go into here, you've got your offset voltages. So if you want to, you can choose an offset. So if you're kind of underclocking or whatever you want to do, you can add a voltage or reduce voltage if you or maybe uh, temperatures are getting a little bit high, or maybe you want to squeeze a little bit more power, then you could choose a bit more, add 50 millivolts, add 100 millivolts, that sort of thing. Where it's red there, that means obviously that's getting into uh, kind of scary territory or potentially could cause damage to your processor if you haven't got sufficient cooling, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, don't go crazy in there. Make 50 millivolts, either way, shouldn't make a great deal of difference for either underclocking or overclocking too much. Um, as you obviously go over 100, things can be a little bit more scary, but certainly you can use the offsets there, which is always handy to do. Uh, for me, a minus 50 generally is very good and is a, will actually reduce temperatures quite a bit, especially when it comes to precision boost overclocking, where it tends to spike a little bit. Again, if you're not sure, hit it also. 
uh, V-Core North Bridge offset. So you've got the options to do exactly the same thing for your North Bridge. So you can go and change the settings there. You've got your uh, 1.8 voltage, which is set to auto. Again, if you want to, you can change that, put in a manual section and the same for the VDDP. Currently set to 1.05 and set to auto. Again, unless you know what you're doing, I would leave those well alone. Uh, when you've actually done those, there are 10 profiles. So you can save your overclocking profile and you can obviously load them. So if you do one profile and it works particularly well, you can save it, call it something specific. So let's uh, let's save this user default now. So choose one, we'll call this uh, mub one. And there we go. So if we made any changes, we could then save it as mub two. And if that didn't work, we can revert back to mub one. So that is the user defaults. The, you can actually save those to a USB drive if you want to. So I could save mub one to a USB drive for uh, transfer into another motherboard. Although realistically, you probably want to see which individual motherboard. They all perform slightly differently. So I wouldn't necessarily expect two boards to perform exactly the same, but potentially you can save your settings anyway. So that is uh, pretty much it for that section of OC Tweaker. So now we can go over into Advanced. So this is your advanced settings. So you've got CPU configuration. Uh, tells you about the processor, pretty much like it did on the front page. Uh, tells you core speeds, or etc. how many millivolts you're currently running at. You've got your cache levels there. So you've got your PSS support which is for basically ACPI and power savings, all that kind of stuff. Uh, your power states, so you can adjust your power states. Three options there, zero, one, and two. I'll be completely honest with you, I have no idea what they do, uh, but you can adjust them should you wish to. I don't know if it makes much difference. Let me know in the comments. Uh, you've got your NX mode, which is the basically like a security function, so you can enable or disable the non-execute page, which is basically a, like a memory protection thing. I would leave that as enabled and unless you have a specific reason not to. Uh, maybe if you're doing some development work or something that perhaps needs it, then you could do. SMV is for CPU virtualization. So if you're running a virtual machine, you can turn that on. Um, generally, I would say leave that disabled unless you have a specific reason to. For more of a security reason, really, because there is, well, there has been things where basically a virtual machine is running in the background of your system, either mining or doing things or recording keystrokes so leave it disabled unless you have a reason to actually have it enabled next up we've got smt mode which is essentially your uh, multitasking or multi-threading so if you disable this then you only have six cores on this particular processor if it's enabled then you get six cores 12 threads so this is basically to enable or disable the multi-threading on that obviously also or disabled uh, next one is the firmware FTP switch. So you can choose whether to enable or disable FTP. Um, so you can have the actually in the processor itself. So AMP, AMD CPU FTPM, or you can route it to a add-on. So like a, a USB or a uh, motherboard header, or you can disable it entirely. I'm gonna disable it because uh, otherwise it will try and install Windows 11 when it can. So next is PCI configuration, uh, similar sort of stuff going on here. So this is your uh, SRIOV. So this is for virtualization. If you're enabling virtualization, you probably want to enable this as well. Currently it's disabled. You can choose enabled or disabled. Uh, in this section, normally as well, if your system supports it, uh, you've got the above 4G decoding and also the resizable bar support. Now, obviously I haven't got a graphics card in here that supports it or a processor currently. So resizable bar is grayed out or disabled. Obviously, if you want to enable it, just change it in there. So let's go back to previous level. So onboard devices, this might be useful for some of you. So uh, turn on LEDs in S5, you can choose enabled or disable. So again, if this is in a sleep mode, you can turn, it, turn the LEDs off, all that kind of stuff. The HD audio, so this is the onboard HD audio, you can set to auto enabled or disabled. Depending on what you're doing, generally auto is fine. You, probably most people will find that their audio is routed through the HDMI port, but um, you will need this enabled or disabled depending on what your setup is. So this is the front panel audio selection. So this is actually something which we don't see that often nowadays. So you've got the option there for HD or AC97. Uh, AC97 was an older specification for front panel audio connectors. You'd select this based on what your case actually supports. Pretty much all cases on the market these days all support HD audio rather than AC97. So I would leave that set to HD. That's if you're using your onboard audio. 
and you've got restore on AC after power loss. So if your uh, PC for some reason turns itself off, when the power comes back on, you can choose for the system to power back up or power off. Um, if it's a server or some kind of device which needs to be on all the time, surveillance system or whatever, then you probably want to set to power on. Um, I've got it set to power off. So if for some reason the PC is in standby mode, the power gets turned off during the day while I'm not here, and then the power comes on, you don't want the PC to necessarily come on by itself. So yeah, left it to power off. Uh, next one, storage configuration. So this is for your SATA ports and your M.2. So you've got SATA port enabled, so you can disable all your SATA ports if you want to. Your SATA mode, you can choose RAID or AHCI. Obviously, if you're creating a RAID array in software, then you'd need to have that set to RAID. If you're just using a normal disks, then AHCI is what you want to use. SATA hot plug is disabled. Um, you, I think pretty much most people will leave that disabled. There's no real point of having hot plug enabled. I don't think you actually have the hardware to support it in most cases. Underneath that, you've got your storage support list, so drives that are actually connected. And if there's any Ultra M.2s or all that kind of stuff, they will be listed there. Currently, I've got installed an NVMe drive, the Samsung SSD 981TB, so obviously that is shown where we are. ACPI, so this is all power management stuff. You've got suspend to RAM, so depending on your power saving methods, you can choose to enable or disable that. Again, entirely up to you for standby modes. Deep sleep, you've got enable, uh, enable or disable. You've got enable in S4 and S5, so it depends what you want to do. Some people prefer to go deep sleep. If you don't, again, this is where you can make all the changes. Uh, PS2 keyboard, S4 and S5 wake up support. So if you've got a PS2 keyboard that you're using, and you want to use a keyboard press to wake up the system when it is in deep sleep, then you'd need that to be enabled. USB keyboard and mouse power on, basically the same sort of thing. So if your PC is asleep, we'll set that to enable actually, because we do want our USB keyboard to do that. Obviously you can choose your PCIe devices as well, should you wish to. So if you've got a card, like a LAN card, wake on LAN, you could do it through that. Um, I'm going to actually set that to that. And also you've got your real time clock alarm power on, so you can set a, a particular time for the system to come on, either by the operating system or enabled, and you can set a specific time so the PC will turn itself on at X o'clock, and uh, yeah, pretty straightforward, and obviously pretty self-explanatory. Super IO configuration, so this is for the kind of older stuff, so serial port is currently enabled, and you can change your serial port addresses, change the IRQ should you need to. Um, actually, I'm gonna disable that because just something else we don't have to worry about. Uh, PS2 Y cable, you can if you want to, you can enable it so that you can use a splitter cable. So even though this board, I think, I'm gonna have to have a look. Yes, the, it only has one PS2 port on the back, so if you've got it set to auto, it'll recognize if there's two devices plugged into one PS2 cable, so keyboard and mouse. So that is that part. Uh, trusted computing, so this is going to be for your TPM, for Windows 11, that sort of stuff, or if you're using things like BitLocker in Windows 10. So you've got security device support, enabled or disabled. I'm going to leave it enabled for now just so we can see what is here. So you've got your uh, SHA-1 bank, and you've got your 256-bit banks enabled or, or disabled. So you can enable those or disable them. Got pending operations, so these are very, very kind of um, complex, overly complex for what it needs to be. So there's a lot going on here, which I personally find that trusting computing is a pain in the backside, because it does affect so many other things, including obviously being able to boot your system should you need to. So I would suggest, if possible, disable it, because it's just an absolute pain. But yeah, you've got things like your platform hierarchy. So you've got enabled or disabled storage hierarchy. It's like this doesn't make any real sense. Uh, you've got the option of changing your spec of the UEFI spec version. So TPM 2.0 is the current one, which is obviously for kind of like Windows 10 and later. If you're on Windows 8, you might find that you have to toggle that to 1.2. Uh, that's going to be for a very, very minor amount of people, I'm guessing. Anyway, I'm going to disable that now because it's uh, yeah, not really something that I wish to use. Uh, AMD PBS, so this is uh, your PCI Express configuration effectively. 
So you've got your PCIe graphics lanes, so currently set to 16x. Obviously, depending on your setup, if you've got a larger board with more slots, then you might want to run an 8x8 configuration or 8x4x4 or 4x4x4. Basically, you've got 16 lanes for your main PCI Express graphics lanes. How do you want to use them? Most people are going to stick to 16 unless there's a specific reason not to. Uh, next one, PML1SS. I've got no idea what that is, I'll be completely honest with you. I'm going to probably have to look in the manual and see what that actually means because it doesn't even say on the side there. Uh, unused GPP clocks off. So graphical processing cycles you can turn on or off. I don't really understand why that is. Uh, I would leave these as the defaults. NVMe RAID mode. So this is going to be for your um, PCI Express lanes if you're using NVMe RAID, which I don't think you can actually do on this board anyway because there's only, well, there is two slots, but they don't support the same drive. So I don't think you can actually do it on here anyway. So disabled would be the way you'd have it. Your PCI Express 16 speed. So if you've got a an older graphics card, you might want to refer this back to Gen 3. Um, or if you're installing a Gen 4 card in this board because it's B450, rather than let it try to auto negotiate, you could tell it to use Gen 3. That could actually genuinely be useful for some of you out there if you're buying new modern graphics cards. Maybe you've picked up a cheap um, RX 6500 XT, which is a Gen 4 card, but it only runs on by four, so that might cause issues. So yeah, changing it to Gen 3 may resolve some performance or um, stability issues. Your M.2 PCI Express speed, again, if you've got an older drive, you may wish to change the Gen of it, um, or if you've got a Gen 4 drive in a Gen 3 slot, again, same deal, just to prevent any issues or communication problems. Most of the time, that's gonna be set as auto, but realistically, you could probably set a Gen 3 and it's not gonna make any problems because you can't get any higher than Gen 3 on this board anyway. Uh, PCI Express speed, so you've got your, this is between the links between the chipset. So I would set that to auto, there's no reason to change that at all. Then you've got these two adjust modes. I have no idea what they're for, so we'll skip those entirely. Next is AMD overclocking. So you get the usual message that this could cause damage. So we'll click accept. So you've got manual CPU uh, overclocking, your core control. So you can choose how many cores are actually active on the system. So for certain overclocking things, you may want to reduce the kind of CCXs or the cores just to get more out of them. Because obviously more cores need more power, etc., etc. Next we've got eco mode. So in there you've got eco mode. So 65 watt Matisse is group B. That's what we're currently on. So you've got your kind of restrictions, etc. If you want to reduce your power output or your power limitations, then you can enable that. I would leave that disabled to get the most out of your processor. Uh, PBO or precision boost overdrive or precision boost overclocking. So this basically allows the system to go over and above what AMD's intended ratings are. Generally, most boards will be set to auto, but it won't be overly aggressive. So you can go into uh, either disable if you want to, to reduce your temperatures, etc. enabled will basically kind of let it run a little bit more wild and probably give you maybe 100 megahertz more. If you want to go a little bit further, if you go to advanced, then you can choose your PBO limits. So you can choose basically automatic limits. You can disable limits, so it will just keep on going as far as it possibly can. You can choose it to your motherboard or you can choose it to manual. So you can set your PBO limits for PBT, TLC, EDC, etc. So this is like your um, electrical limitations, motherboard limitations, all that kind of stuff. So I would set that to, well, depends what you want to do. I would set it to auto, leave that as enabled and it will just do its own thing. That for me, I think most motherboards will work much better than the kind of individual, unless you spend a long time doing it. Uh, you may find auto will give you slightly lower temperatures okay. in advanced. So you've got your PBO limits, uh, precision boost scaler. So you can choose the scaler. So you can basically choose different scalers, try them, see it, see if it makes much difference to your system. Reality is unless you tweak it a little bit, it probably won't do. So, uh, yeah, you could choose the times to run the system, do some benchmarks, see if it improves things, see if your temps are within sensible ranges, see if your system is stable. Um, you've got your CPU boost clock override. So you, normally you would probably get somewhere in the region of 100 megahertz is what most people will tend to get from uh, precision boost overclocking as a general rule. So if you want to, you could set it to 200 megahertz 
set the scale to auto and basically that would give you probably the best fighting chance of actually getting a decent overclock of possibly even 200 megahertz on the system you'd have to try all silicon is slightly different so you may get uh, better or worse results 100 megahertz pretty much every processor should do that very easily uh, platform thermal throttle limit so you can set that to auto or manual and you can set your limit in uh, basically the thermal throttle limit in degrees celsius so if there is a particular point so maybe i think it sets default is 80 but you can maybe set it to 90 and see how things go um, obviously on your own head be it if you're not too sure or you put in the wrong thing just type in zero or set that back to automatic and it will uh, undo those settings uh, ln2 mode so that is if you're doing some ln2 overclocking you can turn that on or off uh, disable it there's no point in having that on because we're never going to do liquid nitrogen cooling next one you've got your l clock frequency so you can choose the settings there you've got auto enabled or disabled and also you've got your uh, l clock dpm enhanced pcie detection again unless you know what you're doing here i would set it to auto i don't know what i'm doing so i'm going to definitely leave that as auto uh, AMD CBS, so this is again more of the same really, so you've got common options, uh, performance wise, again, lots and lots of things. There's tons of stuff actually for the P-States, which you can go in and change frequencies and your P-States. Again, if you're not entirely sure, I would leave these well alone. ASRock are one of those companies which give you way, way too many features for the kind of, I would call the, the casual user. For hardcore overclockers, then you've got so much stuff that you could do here. Uh, you've got Northbridge stuff here. Actually, this we should probably take a little bit of a closer look at. So, uh, IOMMU, so you can enable or disable that. That is more for uh, if you're doing virtualization, that kind of stuff. You can enable or disable. PCIe ARRI support. I don't think I've ever known anyone enable that for any reason. If you've done differently, please let us know. Uh, HD audio enable. So, this is where you can enable or disable your HD audio. So, normally it's set to auto. So, we'll leave it at that. You can choose other things smu common options so you're getting loads and loads more states which you can change enable air cap which is your error reporting again it's uh there's a, a lot going on here should you wish to s risk i've got no idea what that is whatsoever <laughs> so i'm gonna leave that well alone uh active page on entry so you can choose which screen you go into straight on bar so if you're doing a bit of overclocking you can get it so that when you tap delete to start up you can choose to go into oc tweaker advanced tool hardware monitor etc uh security boot whatever most people are obviously going to leave it with main i would imagine uh full hd uefi bios if uh for some reason your system or your monitor doesn't support the 1080p display for the bios and you can change that to disabled um, again, auto if supports 1080p it'll do it if not it will set down to 1024 by 768 which it will do on some older televisions as well so i think that is it for this section so let's go over to uh tool so rgb led pretty much does what it says on the tin so you can go in here and you can default what your bios is doing or actually the system in general so whatever you set here if you don't install the ASRock software, the, I can't even think what it's called now, the, whatever their lighting software is called, it will basically stick to this. So if you want to turn off your LED controller, you don't want any RGB, so you can just set it to off, do apply to all channel, and that will essentially turn off your RGBs after the next reboot. Um, if you not, set it to whatever you want to do. So scan, neon, water, rainbow, etc. I generally set it to rainbow because that's kind of like what most people expect to see. So that is the RGB LED, uh, easy RAID installer. So if you want to set up a RAID, you can go in and do that here. You will need to have a CD-ROM connected to actually create the bootable USB drive, should you wish to install your system in RAID mode. Uh, SSD secure array. So if you want to securely erase your SSD, you can do it in here. If you want to sanitize your NVMe, you can do it in there. And instant flash is to flash the BIOS. So you can go in there and it will say, obviously, if you've got uh, BitLocker included, all that kind of stuff, it will give you warnings about that now, which is a bit of a pain. It does say there about disabling FTPM before you update the BOSS, which is uh, always a good thing. It obviously gives you the 
option to continue or not. So we're not going to because we've already flashed our bus. We're on the latest version. So we can ignore that now. So that's it for tool hardware monitor. So this is going to give you what is going on in your system. So CPU temperatures, as you can see at the moment, 36 degrees Celsius. Uh, motherboard temperatures, 32 degrees. We've got some re relatively good cooling going on here. CPU fan speed one, uh, speed two, so it gives you a readout of what is connected. So at the moment, we've got our all-in-one radiator or AIO radiator connected to fan one. We've then got our chassis fan is our pump. It's in pump mode, so that's spinning at 3,600 RPM. And we've got a fan at the front of the PC, which is an MSI fan, which is running at around about 700 RPM. So it tells you what's going on. It's quite useful. So CPU fan setting one, if we scroll down. So it currently is set to customize. Uh, there are options for silent mode, standard mode, performance or high speed or full speed rather. So I choose it to be customized. You can choose what it's monitoring, either the motherboard or the CPU temperature readouts. And most of you know, if you've watched our videos before, Generally, I set a fan curve, almost the same for everything. Uh, it makes kind of benchmarking and testing more favorable or easier to do. So 30 degrees, 30% 30 fan, 50 degrees, 50% fan, 60 degrees, 60% fan, and at 70 degrees, I have my fans set to 100%. Uh, also, we can set our critical temperature here. So we're critical CPU temperatures, 80 degrees, which point the system will physically shut down. And that is all for CPU fan setting one. On this one, we've got fan two or water pump, because you can use those as water pumps if you want to on the additional headers. Currently there's nothing connected here, so um, I've not got any settings at all, but you can go through and basically change the settings as you did previously. Uh, over temperature protection, we've got enabled, so if the system gets too hot, it's gonna shut itself down. Case open feature, there is a header on the board for that, but it's disabled because, well, why would you wanna use it? Uh, fantastic tuning you can go into, and in here you can choose to set up all your fans, CPU fan, all the different headers there. So there are technically five headers that you can adjust. And if you want to, you can set them so they're all the same, or you can choose an individual fan and set your own curves like you can see there. And you can choose whether they're monitoring the CPU or monitoring the motherboard. They, they should all be monitoring the uh, CPU or at least that's the way I set it. Yeah, save changes. It's not the uh, the nicest of uh, settings, this fantastic tuning, but I guess it gets the job done. So yeah, you can customize things there, all the usual kind of stuff. So let's press escape. Uh, fan tuning, you can go into there and it will say, this will basically find the high and low points of your fans. I've already done that before, so I'm not gonna do it now, but if you wanna work out what your fans can actually do, then you can choose OK and it'll scan all your fans. Next, we can go into security. So if you want to set a supervisor password for the access in the BIOS, you can do, and also a user password. Uh, supervisor password is basically like an admin password, should you wish to. Uh, you've also got secure boot there, so you can enable or disable secure boot, should you need to, for your operating system. And you can install the default secure boot keys which will be for kind of Windows 10, that sort of stuff, or you can choose to clear them. And you've also got key management, so you can disable or enable that. All the platform keys, and you can see there's none stored currently. Generally, again, if you're not sure what you're doing, if you do mess around in here and you're not sure what you're doing, you can get to the point where you won't be able to access your system anymore. So uh, do be careful what you're doing in there. In this section here, it says HDD security. It's telling you your drives that are connected, which potentially you could secure. Next one over is going to be your boot options. So uh, you can choose your boot option, which drive you boot from first. Currently it's set to Windows Boot Manager on our Samsung drive. If you are using a non-UFI system, then you could you just choose that or disable a drive should you want to. Boot option two, if there's more than one drive connected, then you could choose that. Uh, I'll choose that disable because there's no point in having that. This is where some of you might find useful. So hard drive BBS priorities. So boot option one, if there's more than one drive, you can choose which one is the primary drive. So if there's two drives with Windows on, one's new, one's old, you can choose which drive is your preferred boot drive. Boot from LAN, enabled or disabled, you can choose. Uh, set up prompt time timeout, one second. Uh, boot up with number lock, I've got that enabled. Full screen logo, you can enable or disable that, depending on what you want to do. 
Uh, Add-on ROM display, so you can change that if you want to. Uh, fast boot, you've got option to turn that on if you want to. So if your system um, is supporting fast boot, generally I would say leave this disabled. Um, it, probably it's better to leave it disabled so that the system actually checks all your components, memory, graphics card, all that kind of stuff at the beginning. Also as well, if fast boot is enabled, you may find you can't actually access the BIOS anymore by tapping the delete key. You'd have to physically clear the CMOS or uh, remove the BIOS battery, that sort of stuff. Uh, CSM is the compatibility support module. You can choose that to be enabled or disabled. Actually, I'm going to disable that because we don't necessarily need it. Generally, that's going to be if you're using older hard drives or older graphics cards, or maybe you've installed Windows on an older drive which supported CSM, so it isn't fully supporting UEFI. So this was installed recently using a UEFI, UEFI installer. All the components support it, so we yeah, don't really need CSM. But again, if you've got older hard drives which have been in, used on previous systems, using uh, MBR rather than GPT file systems or boot records, then you might need to do that. So that's it, I think, for booting. Yeah, uh, so next one is exit. So you've got save changes and exit, which obviously we'll probably end up doing shortly. Discard changes, if you're not sure and you're a little bit hesitant, uh, you can discard changes and just reset and still go back in. And you can also load the BIOS defaults. If you're getting problems with your system, loading UEFI BIOS defaults might be the way forward because uh, that'll be basically factory settings and you've got the option there to launch the shell from the file system device. You've got your boot override there, so if you choose boot override, if you choose that one, then it will boot from that drive. Basically, whatever drives are listed there, whichever one you click on will be the next one that the system boots from as a temporary measure. We'll cancel that. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's going to be pretty much it. Like I said, if there's anything else, you can click on the QR code down over in this corner and get more information. But I'm going to save changes and exit, and I think that is uh, pretty much going to be it. Okay, so there you go. There is a quick BIOS tour. The system's actually booting back up behind me, and I just realized I set the memory to DDR4-3200 overclocking from the 3000, and yes, it appears to have booted. So excellent. Not only have I got to make a video, I've also overclocked my RAM as well although I've got an error mesh on the screen, so we better take care of that. So that's going to wrap this one up. Any comments or questions, stick them in the section below. If you want a little bit more in-depth one-to-one, then head over to the Discord and head into one of the tech support rooms, and I'll be happy to help you, or at least try to, or maybe explain some things to you. Yep, I think that's going to wrap this one up. I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.